everyone. This is Criminal Profiler Pat Brown, and this is Patron Hangout number 108. And I want to say hello to everybody in the chat room. Please do tell me if you can see and hear me. This time, my microphone is actually next to the, the laptop. So you should be able to hear me, but I'm just going to check in with all of you and see whether everything is good before I carry on. So, um, and if you'd like to be, while I'm waiting for people to say that, I would like to welcome you to... Uh, to uh, join in in the chat room. And you can do that by clicking the, the uh, link below for pa Patreon. You can join for five bucks a month. It supports this educational channel and get you into eight live shows a month. So you can be here when they're taped and you can be in the chat, chat room. So please do that. Uh, otherwise, please do like the, like the uh, show. Please do subscribe to the channel. So you don't have to pay money. You can always subscribe. All my shows are public. Uh, even the live shows that I do patron only will become public after the show is done. So I want everybody to learn. This is an educational channel. So I want everybody to, everybody. <laughs> I just love it when I can't speak. I want everybody to learn. And uh, one recommendation I have, because I was talking with someone today who said she would love to go through an entire case with me. Like, so see if she's thinking in, in, in a good and analytical manner, like a profiler. And I said to her, look, this is what you do. You pick any one of my videos, you look at the case, you go watch any documentary, read a book, uh, look at news reports, whatever. You make your determinations before the, you look at the show and then you just click the video and you see, well, how do I analyze it? And then you compare your analysis against mine. You see what makes sense and what might, what maybe didn't make sense. Um, and you, that's a good way to learn and you don't have to pay any money except if you have to pay for the, the documentary or the book, but, um, but you can learn that way. And it's almost like a private little lesson. So I suggest that anybody who wants to learn crime scene analysis, criminal profiling, everything on here is available for you to learn from. So anyway, hello everybody in the chat room. All right. I can see in here. Okay. Uh, everybody is here that's here. And, uh, <laughs> um, oh, well, that's a nice way to look at it. I'm not sure what evolved means, Sarah, but I have become more evolved thanks to Pat. Uh, I just hope one learns um, just more about how, how profiling works, how crime scene analysis works, and how, well, you'll see how my brain works. It doesn't, your brain doesn't have to work like my brain. Um, but one of the reasons I like to do this show is so I can actually take you through how I think. And I'm not saying my thinking is always correct because no experts is always 100% on the mark, just to be realistic. Um, but you can see how I think through things. And therefore, you can then say to yourself, how do I want to look through these things? As opposed to some channels, the profiler just pontificates and says, this is what happened. And this is what I say. This is my analysis. And they never tell you how they got there. I want you to know how I got there because otherwise it's not educational. It's just whatever. <laughs> me, me thinking I'm very important. All right. So let's get to it. A bunch of stuff today. I know everybody's want to me to talk about Suzanne Morphew because her body has just been found. Um, and before I get to that though, I want to jump over for the people who are still awake in the UK <laughs> if you're, or, or Benny who's in Denmark. And um, I'm going to do a couple cases from there. Um, the first one is just, this is just, this just goes to show you that Sometimes it's so sad, no matter what a parent does, they may not be able to protect their child. And this particular case comes out of Croydon, um, out of England. And her name, let me hold on a second. I'm trying to find, here's, here's, here's the, she is a 15 year old girl. This, this is her 15 years old. She's in her school uniform. Uh, here she's not in her school uniform. She's a very pretty girl, 15 years old. She wanted to be a lawyer. And because she had these high goals, her, her mother was from uh, West Africa, I believe. Um, and her mother worked to put her in a very, very expensive private school, like $20,000 a year. So her daughter would get the best education. And supposedly her daughter was a very, very, how do you want to put it? A great kid, a great kid with, with dreams. And the one problem was she took the public bus to that school. And she had a friend, apparently were on the bus and they got off the bus. And while, when they got off the bus, 
her friend had a, an ex-boyfriend and the, the, one of the, one of the most dangerous things for girls is to have a boyfriend, <laughs> teenager, that becomes an ex and then becomes a stalker. The second worst thing is to have a friend who has an ex-boyfriend who becomes a stalker. So anyway, her friend, they got off the bus and apparently this guy gave the girl, his her friend, some flowers and like, oh, we're going to get back together. And she rejected the flowers. So they got off the bus and her friend was arguing with this fellow. And this really nice girl, let me give you her name. Elian Adam, she intervened trying to stop the argument. And the guy pulled out a foot long, I would call it a cutlass. I don't know. They called it something else. They called it like a zombie knife or something. Like, hold on a second. Let me see what they called it. I would call it a cutlass. Uh, but yeah, let's see here. Okay. So yes, um, boy reportedly pulled out the foot long serrated zombie knife. Maybe it is not a cutlass. Maybe it's some kind of one of those thing, things you buy that, you know, for ninja kind of, you know, the fake ninja stuff um, and stabbed her in the neck and chest just because she intervened with the argument, trying to help. Hey guys, cut, you know, stop. He, and she died on the spot. And apparently this is like the 15th stabbing of a teenager in, uh, in, in London this year. So uh, I'm not going to get into a, a gun versus knife thing, but let me tell you, when, when you have a gun, it's easier to use, but knives work pretty well too. And some people are very used to using knives. As a matter of fact, it's an interesting cultural issue again. And people don't like to talk about cultural issues sometimes, but uh, essentially we're comfortable with what we're comfortable with. Um, so some people are into the gun culture in certain, certain areas, and that's what they play with. That's what they practice with. That's what they go out, sh you know, shoot targets with. That's what they play sh uh, shooting games with. They're into guns. There are other cultures that are highly into uh, uh, cutlasses. What's the other name for a cutlass? Um, machete, machetes and all these things. And because people do a lot of farm work uh, and so on and so forth. So, and they're used to having that item in their hand and, you know, and so for them, Hmm. Now, this guy, I don't know what this guy is. He could also just be a knife freak who was into, you know, all kinds of, you know, weird. So there's some guys that are like into this ninja stuff and they, and they get, get all kinds of weird knives. Um, but sometimes culturally that the, the, the um, implement people will end up using to kill someone varies depending um, on the culture. Uh, but what a horrific thing. So here's a, here's a mother who does everything in her power to make sure her, her daughter can have a successful life. But you end up with problems with who does your daughter associate with? Who do her friends associate with? Did they even, was this guy a creeper all the way along? Was he a bad sort? Or was he somebody who literally nobody had a clue was a fruitcake, you know, was a psycho? <laughs> Sometimes you don't know. Um, they didn't say who the boy is yet. So I don't know. Um, but it, you do all that. And so dangerous ex-boyfriends, friend of da dangerous ex-boyfriend. Two very, very dangerous, dangerous things. And just a, such a sad case. So um, uh, that, that's also true. Um, Sarah, you're correct. Intimacy influences weapon used sometimes. That is true. The old saying is that the more intimate, the more likely you're going to get like strangulation, uh, up close stuff where, although serial killers like that crap too. So, <laughs> but you're right. That has some, something. Um, um, oh, oh. Uh, I'm not, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, he didn't like being broken up with, but he, by the, but here's the interesting thing. The question is, was he planning to kill the ex-girlfriend? Because he brought the knife with him. He didn't give her the flowers. She rejected him. And then he thought, oh my God, this really sucks. And ran and got a rock and hit her. No, he brought a big knife with him. So it is very possible if the, this poor girl hadn't intervened, he would have killed the other girl because she rejected, you know, rejected him and the, you know, said she didn't want to get back with him. Hard to say, but really, really sad situation. Just Benny nailed it. What did Benny nail? Let me, I got to go back and see what Benny said. Oh, there you go. <laughs> hey, Benny, Benny, why was he carrying a machete when he came with flowers? He planned something. I must have just said that. <laughs> but Benny actually beat me to it. <laughs> I just didn't see the, I didn't see the, the words go by. Yeah. 
Okay, you're right, Benny. <laughs> that was excellent. Um, uh, see, I, there, there are great profilers on here besides me. All right, I want to talk about the other thing coming out of the UK, Jill Dando. Oh, my goodness. All right, so Netflix has a new Jill Dando series. If you don't know who Jill Dando was, many years ago, she was a t television commentator, and she did stuff on crime, and somebody came up to her on her doorstep and shot her as she was trying to get in the house. And um, this guy was arrested and charged and convicted. This guy's named Barry George. And eventually they let him go. There was all people fighting free Barry George because he didn't do it. Uh, he was a stalker guy. Um, uh, he, he, uh, he, he had some interesting stuff that may, if you look back, I'll, I'll link my, um, my video on uh, Jill Dando below. Um, I find that the evidence points to Barry George as a stalker guy. Because uh, what happened on her doorstep to me did not look professional, did not look like hit. And but oh my goodness. So here the the documentaries come out and it's a three part series. And one of the complaints is, well, they go through three parts, but they never come to a conclusion. That's because there isn't one outside of Barry George. So they're going, uh, she pissed off these the some kind of mafia. She pissed off these people. She pissed off those people. So this this idea is out there that there's these groups of criminal, especially from Eastern Europe and so on and so forth, that she was reporting on. And that's why they killed her. And if you know, if you, generally speaking, if you look at commentators, crime scene, crime people, most most of these groups know that the person who's doing this is not doing the investigating. They're just they're just the face in front of the camera. Now, mind you, sometimes in political issues, like if you go back to the Pablo Escobar days uh, in Colombia, I mean, yeah, a lot of, a lot of uh, journalists got killed. They got killed because they were investigating, personally investigating and looking into Pablo, Pablo Escobar. But I, don't, I never found convincing evidence that Jill Dando herself was so important in the investigative process. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I never saw it, that anybody came to needed to assassinate her essentially. And I never found that the attack on her doorstep looked professional in the slightest. So I'm still with Barry George, who apparently made a very strange appearance. It says here, made a bizarre appearance. He actually plays out the role <laughs> of him killing Jill Dando <laughs> in the documentary. That's weird. <laughs> so Anyway, do I recommend the documentary? Well, it's better than the last documentary, um, but that was years ago. Um, yeah, I, I, they never come up with anything convincing outside of Barry George, but Barry George is free because people freed Barry George because they said he didn't do it. So there you go. Um, but interesting, interesting. Um, <laughs> Netflix is usually on the wrong side. Uh, there's a reason for that. The problem with... The, they always want something controversial. Controversial isn't, uh, yeah, you know that guy who got arrested and convicted? Yeah, he did it. <laughs> you can't make a show out of agreeing. So you have to disagree. You have to have people on the side of, oh, he didn't do it, he didn't do it, we got to save this poor man. So yes, they tend to go toward that side because that's what makes good television. And and they don't, and the idea of journalism where you present the evidence and you present things in a very um, solid and uh, factual way. And if you have experts on, they speak in a factual manner. Um, that doesn't really exist because the, because everything is set up this way to, to, to stimulate the viewers, to get them excited, to get them angry, to get them, they want the drama. And if they don't have the drama, they don't get the, the money. So they make sure this drama and, they aren't concerned about the truth. That's just, that's just a fact. And it's sad. Journalists, anybody doing any kind of journalism and documentary should be concerned about the truth and not how much money it makes them. But that's not the world we live in. So there you go. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I thank you, Lex. This is excellent. If they kill Jill, they just get a new TV presenter to report on the cases they're working on. Thank you. So it seems pointless killing her for that reason. Yeah. Now, TV personalities get way more stalkers, don't they? Why? Because they're on TV and people get obsessed with them. And that's what Barry George did. He got obsessed with different 
people who were very famous. Um, that's much more rational than, yes, they wanted to get rid of her so they could replace her with another blonde. <laughs> you know, it's like, Meh. yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I wasn't very impressed with that. All right. So moving on to Suzanne Morphew. I know everybody's got us wonder about that one because they just found her body. So we have Suzanne Morphew here with her husband, Barry, and the two girls. It looks like a happy family, except she ends up dead. Um, and they just found her body. Now, they found, now, mind you, this is Barry. They thought, I mean, they're pretty sure it must be a thing with the name Barry. <laughs> now, Barry Morphew, it is Barry Morphew, right? I'm beginning to wonder now. Um, they, um, they think he, the, the police have always thought he did it. Okay. Let me find the information, uh, the new information. All right. All right. Yes, Barry, 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 bad name. Um, uh, his is from the Daily Mail. And I will say again, because I just have to be truthful. The Daily Mail has the best crime reporting that I've ever come across. Every time I get frustrated with 10 different, different places, I go, I put, I type in Daily Mail and I get much more information and much more accurate information. Go figure. Cause I know we all call it the Daily Fail. At least I've been around too many Brits to not call it the Daily Fail. <laughs> and I'm not saying they're, they don't have a tabloid quality, but oddly they get, they get the information on crimes, even in the U S before the people in the U S get anything. Go figure. Anyway, Suzanne Morpheus scattered remains were found in a shallow grave in a remote desert field, 40 minutes from her home. Husband Barry says he's relieved she has been found and again protests his innocence. Okay, let me show you where her body was found. She supposedly went riding uh, on a bicycle ride in the morning and then disappeared, and her bike was found. So you see there, um, this where his home was, the Morphew home. See, it's in a place called Salida. Uh, the bike was found supposedly right there. I, I'm not sure how accurate this, this picture is. But anyway... Her bike was found, and then her body was found down in the shallow grave in a place called Moffat. All right. Now, if you see where, if you see the picture on top, that's where Barry Morphew was supposed. That was his location when she vanished. Okay. Now, here's where I had a problem. One of the things when I looked at Barry Morphew, did 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 he seem like he is an excellent suspect? I said yes. Where did I think her body might be found? Well, the more lo most logical place is that it would be somewhere between the Morphew home and where, and, and where he ended up in that other location, to the north. There are so many back roads and gull uh, all kinds of, uh, just so many ravines and things. You could chuck her body in there. I said, well, that's where I would be looking. However, her body was found to the south. Okay, 50 miles to the south, and then he's up there working. And they say that's where he was when she vanished. Okay, so now, you know, I haven't looked at this case in a while. And this is what happens. You're like, I don't remember. When did she... So he was at work when she vanished? So I'm thinking, well, if he was at work when she vanished, well, A, he couldn't have done it. And depending on the timeline, you know, he had to have time. If Let's say he woke up, he woke up in the morning, he said she was in bed when he left for work. Well, let's say she was in bed and they got an argument in the morning and he had to leave for work and be there. Why would her body be 50 miles south in a shallow grave? Maybe she did ride her bicycle out. A serial killer grabbed her and then drove her uh, after he did, no, grabbed her. He drove her someplace, raped, murdered her, and then buried her in a shallow grave going south because he was going south to some other location. So did a serial killer do it? And did Barry Morphew have as, as much as his weird behavior was there, made him suspect number one. Could he have done it even? And so, you know, I'm, I'm like, what was the timeline? Because I couldn't remember the timeline, right? So I went, I, I, I Googled that. What's the timeline? Because, you know, say it's been a while. All right, so here's the timeline. Um, it says here, on May 9th, 2020, um, Investigators said Suzanne Morphew took her last selfie on the afternoon of May 9th. All right. And she, it's the last piece of evidence that shows her alive. She sent the picture to a man in Michigan she was having an affair with. That's on the afternoon prior to this bike ride. All right. Then it says on May 10th, the next day, Suzanne was reported missing on May 10th. Barry claimed 
and I, they did use a proper word, claimed that she was asleep when he left early on May 10th for a business trip to Broomfield. That's the one that's on the map. It was this way, up north. Barry said he sent his wife a happy Mother's Day text, but she didn't respond. When Suzanne didn't return another text and a phone call, Barry said he became concerned and then returned home when a neighbor called to say she was missing. All right. So what, sa what says that she sent that text to her boyfriend on the afternoon? That, that hubby didn't find out about that text. They had an argument. He did something to her. And on that afternoon, evening, nighttime, he drove south away from where he was going to go the next day. He drove south dropped her bicycle on the side of the road, buried her, came home. Now, I haven't looked at this case in a long time, so I don't know if there's any evidence he was actually at home all of this time. So if you you can chime in, because I just don't remember, and I, I'm not doing a full video on this. This is a hangout where I chat about things. So I don't remember whether he had any proof that he couldn't have done this, whether his car like absolutely never left the driveway or any of this stuff. Um, if there was no way he left that house, if her bicycle was still videoed there if his vehicle was still videoed there all the way till morning and then his vid then his uh truck went out and she went out on her bike videoed but you know, see the last time she was seen alive was the day before on uh, in the afternoon so my thinking is there is no proof that she was alive after that afternoon so there if if there's no proof uh that he couldn't have killed her in the home and then taken her south to this location where body was found, driven home, and then gone to work the next morning up in Broomfield. I'd say he's not off the hook yet. What have you heard? Oh, 45. Well, let me see how many comments are coming in here. Um, uh, he could have driven her car. Yeah, I, ju I just don't know. I can't remember. Uh, I said I have to look back and do a lot of research to determine whether any cars were seen going in and out of that house whether they caught anything anywhere. She was reported missing the next day, but that doesn't mean she went missing on the day they reported her missing. And that's the important thing. Um, uh, there was, that's a claim. They found they found a, a tranquilizer dart and they, they think that's what he used. That's not proof that he did it. It's just, that's a good theory because they found the tranquilizer dart issue. You know, they found some evidence there with that. Um, they had pings all around the house after that picture was taken. I don't know what pings means. That are that are that are that her phone was there. That I don't know what that means. Um, um, yes, this is true. She, yeah, there was. They were definitely on the outs. There's no question. And you know, I always am suspicious of people who. Uh, who, they're on their outs. They're on the outs. She's cheating on him, but he's saying happy mother's day and she's not responding. And you know, when people do that, a lot of times it's to show that first of all, I'm on my way to work. I'm, I'm still in good with my wife. I have no idea what happened to her. So it'll be interesting to see exactly what happened. And I'm curious about this location because a lot of times people use a location. They have some fam familiarity with, unless you're just some you know, rogue serial killer who's just driving that way, uh, grabbed her, keeps driving, has time to stop. I have a shovel, you know, because <laughs> deserts are not easy places to dump people. As far as you know, you got to at least cover them up with something. Shallow grave. I don't know. I, I I don't know the area. I'd have to look and see if the area has hard, hard dirt and you can't dig in it, or it has lots of, you know, sand things you can just shovel over somebody. Um, I don't know. Uh, so, Lots, lots. We're going to learn about lots. I just, I just, I don't know more than that. Okay. So you now we got all kinds of interesting stuff today. People being arrested. It's great. All right. Crystal Rogers. People ask about that case. Um, oh, before we go to Crystal Rogers, um, I might, might as well go to her. I'm just going to do this very quickly. Um, Crystal Rogers was killed years ago. Um, and her boyfriend was always the main suspect. Um, and let's see what happened. Oh, let me hold on. So let me find her. Crystal Rogers. Okay, so a month ago, was it a month ago, they arrested uh, this character, uh, who looks scary as crap, and he was supposedly part of this conspiracy, and apparently he had called the boyfriend, who was this guy, uh, the day that 
something happened to, they think something happened to uh, Crystal Rogers. And he also, his dad worked with, I guess, Brooks, and he was the son thereof. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in that. And then that a year after Crystal Rogers, who is, where's Crystal's picture? I think, is that Crystal? Sorry, okay, I messed that one up. Yeah, that's Crystal, I think. Um, I hope. And her, her dad got shot to shot down a year later. They never figured out who shot him. So all kinds of crazy things. But years have gone by. It's been 2015, eight years. They finally arrest. So they arrested this guy last, I think last month. And people are like, okay, what about the boyfriend? And then they arrested him, just arrested him. Oh, what a shame. There he goes. Finally, eight years later. Uh, this morning, the Ballard family um, received word that Brooks Hauk was arrested for indictment warrant after being indicted by a Nelson County grand jury. Brooks Hauk was named the number one suspect in Crystal's case in 2015. And they finally, they, I think they've been working very hard with this whole, because there were more than one person involved. And so they're trying to figure out, and they've never found her body, I don't believe. She was last seen with, last seen with Hauk, uh, reported missing July 5th. That, that day her car was found abandoned with a flat tire on Bluegrass Parkway in Bardston. Her phone, purse, and keys were still inside the car. And everything surrounded those people, but they just couldn't prove it. So, yay, finally. I mean, sometimes they do catch up eventually. I'm not sure what finally gave them enough evidence for them to believe that they could do something with this case. But I know a lot of people have been interested in that case, and I'm, I'm glad to see something came up, but finally. Oh, yeah, okay. Now, I want to go to this case. We're talking about boyfriends, husbands. This case fascinated me. So there is this case. Um, oh, crap. Hold on a second. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I screwed something up here. Okay. I want to find, I want to find the, um, this woman, uh, her name is, uh, hold on. I got to find it. Uh uh, hold on. Okay. Her name is Michaela. All right. Her name is, okay, hold on a second. I'm having trouble with the website here. It sucks. Oh, she's from Oklahoma. This is Michaela. All right. This is Michaela Meave Byers. She's 30 year old teacher's assistant. She went missing on September 15th. Um, and after getting into a Chevrolet pickup truck by a driven by a tall, balding man sporting a dark beard and sunglasses. Okay. This is the way it's written. All right. Then it's, uh, it says also, then this mother of six, and she, those weren't her bio kids, but she had like four, six kids. She took care of the stepkids and I don't know if adopted, but she, she took care of these kids. A mother of six from Oklahoma was found dead and wrapped in an old carpet wedged in a ditch days after going on a date with an unknown man. I'm like, wait a minute. She's married. All right. The woman who was married, but in an open relationship, left her home and make home with a man voluntarily after quote, supposedly agreeing to go out on a date with him. When she failed to return from her outing, law enforcement officials launched a search. Now, on Wednesday, her my, my, me buyer's cousin discovered her body in a nearly four foot deep culvert by a creek running under a road a few miles from her house. The 30 year old victim was wrapped in what Dinwiddie described as a waterlogged old pieces of carpet. All right. Uh, she was a teacher's aide at the Maycomb County uh, Public Schools. She's a great mother. All she cared about was the kids. All right. Now, here is what happens when you're a profiler and you're supposed to look at a case and people want you to have a certain belief system. Like, everybody's the same. No, they're not. So I, I'm looking at her and I'm like, okay. Um, almost everybody who's obese is safe from serial killers and predators. Usually it's their boyfriend or their husband because it's just, that's the way it works, guys. Eat all the ice cream and cake you want, you're safer. Just, just the way it is. Serial killers like thin little things. Now, 
The next thing is, okay, she goes, that says she went on a date. She's in an open marriage. She goes on a date with this man, pulls up. She gets in this vehicle. All right. They're in an open marriage. Still, we have the problem of obesity. If the guy doesn't know her, you know, you can, you know, we can love people of all body shapes. And we can fall in love with people who are obese. We can fall in love with people who are really short. We can fall in love with people who have disabilities because we like them. We really like them. We love them. We, we, we think they're the greatest people in the world. And we don't care about that crap. But dating, people on dating sites and so on and so forth, they're usually not picking obese women to go out with unless they have some kind of fetish. So I'm thinking, is this a, is this a fetish site? What the heck? But then I kept reading this and I'm like, who saw her get into the vehicle with this man? No, and I'm not, I'm not understanding this. They don't know who this man is. So let's, so here's a woman, she's in an open relationship with her husband. I actually suppose they have two different homes. That's a whole nother weird issue. So anyway, um, she's in this open relationship. Okay. I'm not going to judge, but um, usually if you were taking care of six children in an open relationship, you have a paper trail or an internet trail, something. You tell somebody who you're going out with so that you just don't get into a car, a vehicle with a complete stranger and nobody knows who the heck he is. If it's an open relationship, leave some information. But there's no information. And I'm looking at this going, I'm sorry. I don't buy this. I'm like, who said she got into the vehicle with this guy? Well... The only person I think could have said it was the husband. And who should believe the husband? Because normally she would be killed by her significant other. Well, so I, I, I thought that it was just, it was driving me crazy because I couldn't get information that made any sense. Well, guess who they arrested? The husband. <laughs> I'm like, well, there you go. Okay. So, uh, so they arrested, let me see. Okay. So uh, let's see if, uh, I'm trying to see if they've got the, which one had the husband in. Well, anyway, they went to his house and they found, uh, let's see, where is it? Let's see if it's here. Oh gosh, I probably lost my page here. They went to his house. They found a similar bullet from a similar gun that would, that would have killed her. They found blood. Um, yeah, they arrested him. <laughs> and now he's saying everybody on the internet is against me. Well, yeah. Because you probably killed your wife. That's why. Um, but I, I point out this case. I'm not saying the guy's guilty yet. But when you're in analyzing a case, you have to look at things that are statistically true. You don't have to. Now, statistics sometimes aren't. Every case is not part of the statistics. You could have 90 cases one way and just 10, 10 the other. But still, rarely. I have, can't even remember the last time I saw a, a woman who, I know people don't like the word obese, but she's obese, um, that was not killed by a significant other, that she was killed by a complete stranger who kidnapped her. And I say this over and over again, serial killers do not pick on big women. They don't because they're hard to manage. They're hard to get in the vehicle. They're hard to get out of the vehicle. They're hard to get the clothes off. They're hard to, you can't, Fit them in your trunk if you have a small enough vehicle. I have a Mazda Miata. She's not going in the trunk. So there's a lot of logistical reasons why you don't pick large women. And also, they're not trophies. Our society doesn't have heavy women as trophies. I mean, we're working on making them trophies. But most of the time, serial killers like small packages. 120 pounds, little, easy to maneuver, easy to take the pants off of, you know, and a trophy. A little cheerleader-looking girl, if they can get it. Uh, 20 years old is preferable, you know, 16, 15, you know, usually they don't go for older women. And when they do, it's something really strange. You're like, and sometimes uh, teenagers will kill the next door neighbor, elderly woman and rape her just because it's convenient. And he, does, he thinks he can, he can succeed. Uh, that's kind of an interesting thing about young serial killers that they will target uh, old, some elderly women. Um, sometimes the elderly women just beat the crap out of them, which is great. But and we have to we have to look at that and go, what do we know? How do these things work? And so I, I, I right away they kept they never said who was the person that said she got in the vehicle with this this supposed date. Now I know why. 
Hmm. So I thought that was a, a kind of a fascinating case. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, well, I can't, there's not perfect evidence on that either, Linda. That's, that's the media sucked. I mean, if you're going to write a story, can you ask the proper questions? But a lot of media doesn't ask the questions. They're not doing the actual, they're not actually doing the story themselves. They just steal it from other sites. That's the way it works. One person might do the story and then 50 sites will suddenly do the same story. They just, they plagiarize. They literally plagiarize. We you know, Once upon a time, a journalist only wrote a story that he truly or she truly investigated themselves and that they wrote the story. They did the interviews. Now, now they just steal from each other, like, like gangbusters. It's, it's crazy. Like, absolutely crazy. Um, that's why so much stuff is crap. Um, now, now you had to go there. You had to go there, Kathy. <laughs> Do you know, when I looked at every story, everybody said, that must've been a big carpet. And I'm like, Oh, it's so wrong. <laughs> it's just so wrong. But there's an issue, you know, actually, yeah, <laughs> it's terrible, but it's an issue because you have to look at who has a big enough carpet or do they have to piece things together? I mean, as horrible as that sounds, you're going to be looking at that. I'm looking around my house right now. Well, I got a pretty good carpet under the table. <laughs> I, go, eh, I don't know. Maybe a little smaller than her. I definitely could be rolled up in the carpet below, although I'm still overweight. So, <laughs> oh gosh, that's the way things work. All right. Now, what do I want to talk about next? Um, let's see. Oh, this case. Speaking of believing. So now this is, a, this is a problem again. We always want to believe everything. We always want to think everybody is innocent. We hate to even suspect somebody. But sometimes when you're investigating, this is why the police sometimes ask questions, tell people to come in the interview, and the person gets very incensed. It's like, how dare you? I am a victim in this. How can you, how can you even think I have anything to do with this? Because they have to check out things that could be possible. Now, check this case out. So anyway, this dog named Duke, very cute dog. Um, I actually have... Lots of pictures of the missing dog, Duke, just because it was a actually really cute dog. Look at that thing. <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> Aw, that's really cute. Okay, cute dog. All right, so that dog, they're now offering a $2,000 reward because that dog is worth approximately two or $3,000. The Duke was, now, Duke was last seen September 22nd near the corner of Oxen Hill and Road and Livingston Road, Maryland. All right. Now, here's the story, and I'm not saying anybody is, you have to understand, this is an educational channel again. I'm not trying to say this person did or that person did. I'm trying to say, what do you have to do if you're investigating? All right. And now this thing just struck me right away. And because I've done a lot of analysis, things do like pop up straight into my mind going, that doesn't look right to me. Okay, what doesn't look right? Okay, the owners of this dog are desperately seeking this dog. They love this dog. All right, so what happened? This dog, um, they're asking the public to be on the lookout for a dog that was stolen from a dog sitter by two armed suspects on Friday. This is in my county, by the way. It's about uh, 20 minutes down the road from me, maybe 25 minutes. So it's very close to me. All right, so what happened? Here's the story. Hold on a second. Here's the story that is now. Come on, screen. Seriously, my screen is frozen. <laughs> can we not do that? Oh, come on. I know I don't want to load that. Cancel that crap. Can you, can I see? Okay, I got to kind of try to get out of here and go back because it's being obnoxious. All right. Okay, here we go. All right, according to police, and I'm always concerned Okay, right, I'll go. On. The three-year-old pup named Duke was taken around 9:10 p.m. on Friday, September 22nd. The DC couple who owns Duke tells Fox 5 that they were returning home from a trip and have been texting with the sitter in the hours leading up to when they were supposed to get Duke. But then the sitter stopped responding. We knew something was wrong. She's always so responsible. 
It was really unlike the sitter not to hear from her for a couple hours. So we were just beside ourselves waiting, one of the owners said. Um, sorry, I'm still having trouble with the website. Unfortunately, the couple got the news they didn't want to hear about 1 a.m. So they were texting her from 9, 10 o'clock for a couple hours, three hours. They got they, the sitter called to tell them that Duke had been stolen. Uh, the sitter told the couple she was stopping for food on the way to meet them to drop off their dog. The restaurant was apparently closed, so she pulled over in the 10,100 block of Livingston Road in Fort Washington, Maryland, to check her GPS. That's when she said two suspects came toward her, at least one with a armed with a handgun. Uh, the sitter's... Uh, so then they reached, they reached in and they started approached her car, started banging on it, reached in and stole Duke from the back seat. She has a German shepherd, her own German shepherd in the front seat. And that dog is very defensive, very aggressive. So they were not able to get in the front seat. They got the back doors open where Duke was sitting, grabbed him. And that was the last they were able to see him. Duke is about 80 pounds. The couple's asking for a safe return. No questions asked. Now the babysitter was crying. She's a dog sitter. Now, family thinks she's a great person. Wonderful dog, she's a great person. Again, I'm not saying she's not. But here's what strikes me that just bugs me right up front. So, first of all, I'm bothered by the fact it took her too long to call back. Something had happened. But if it had happened and it was over with, wouldn't she call the owners right away? Why would she not answer the phone for so long? That bothers me. Now, the next thing that bothers me, she says she's driving along and the place she was going to get her food it ended up closed. So she pulled off the road to look at the GPS. Now, mind you, it's nighttime. She's at this location. This is the area she claims she pulled over. That's Livingston Road. Now, look at this in the daytime. Look at the road. See all the di different directions? What do you notice about this road? That would make you say, hmm, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> the dog, well, the dog isn't around, so you can't even take the food. Um, the story is BS. In interesting. Inside job? Hmm. Possible. Possible. Um, All right, that's one point. Not a good road to walk on. Why are carjackers walking down this long part of the dark road at night? Carjackers usually go to like shopping malls, places where you can, gas stations. What the hell are they doing walking down this, this, this road? What's the other problem? It's isolated. Yes, but no street lights. Yes. What do you notice though about the road itself? You're driving down the road. You want to look at your GPS. What do you see is the problem here? What's the problem? Uh, no shoulder. Thank you, Sarah. Where the heck do you pull over there? I would that that road has no place to pull over. I would be scared to pull over. They get hit by another car. She, she, you don't pull over to look at your GPS. She know, she's from the area. She just keep, should keep going to the next major intersections. I've been around that area. There's a ton of fast food places. She's not going to starve to death if she goes to the next major intersection, pulls in to any other fast food place, pulls into a gas station, whatever. But you're going to pull over on the side of the road in the middle of the dark where you can't even get on a shoulder? I, to see what's open, to check restaurants in the area that are open. When you're on the way to deliver the dog anyway, what the heck? And then two guys appear out of nowhere. Just as they happen to be on a dark road in the middle of nowhere, because they're not coming from any place or going to any place. It sounds very reasonable to me. And and he, they approach you with a gun and you've got a big dog. So they take the dog in the backseat. Okay, the dog is worth some money. What do they, how, where's their vehicle? How are they? This is a big dog. Isn't he a little doggy? This is a big dog. Some guy's got to try to get, carry this dog down the street. She doesn't call the police, right? They leave her. They don't hurt her. 
So, so the guys approach with a gun, steal the dog out of the back seat, walk away, carrying the damn dog. She doesn't call the police. She didn't talk to the family. Hmm. Uh, yeah, the do dog was worth about 3000 I think. I looked that up. Um, if I were the robber, says Lala, I'd kick everyone else out, take the car and the dog. Well, they had the, the problem with the, the German Shepherd, supposedly. Uh, yeah, it's... <laughs> It's a little suspicious. So, so sometimes it's, again, you want to go believe the story and then you go, did, did, did the, did what, did Michaela really leave with, uh, was she really in an open marriage and got into a vehicle leaving no information to where she was going and get killed by this guy? Oh, the other reason on the other case, her body was found like right next to, like right down the road from the house. So the guy's taking her out to rape and kill her or whatever. Supposedly he's got, he's got to take her someplace. He's got a carpet. He got to take her to a house, but she ends up right next to her house. <laughs> well, that because her husband's house was close by too, because they had these two separate things. So if he was an actual killer, wouldn't he drive farther away? You know, I mean, what's he going to do? I mean, where do you have the carpet? Wait, is it in the back of his, you know, did he have the carpet in the vehicle too? Just in case he wanted to kill her and wrap her up and chuck her right there. It, the story stinks. And when stories stink, you got to take a look at it and say, why does this send up 10 red flags? Something, something's not, something's a wee bit fishy. Something's just not right. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, she'd been babysitting that dog for a long time, supposedly, and they loved her. But that's a suspicious story. So, I mean, so I'm curious to see what will come out of that story, whether there truly were carjackers in the middle of that dark road that she pulled over with a GPS and they only took the dog. And then again, where, where, I don't hear anything about another vehicle. Are they really going to carry that doggy down the street? <laughs> it's like, maybe it was on a leash, but you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Something, something is just, yeah. <laughs> Things that make you go, Hmm, exactly. That's just, that just didn't, that just didn't work for me. Uh, I thought that was, just really interesting. Um, now, I want to point out some... <laughs> I've been talking about cases where you wonder how the heck these people ended up back on the street. I got I got a few of them, and I, I just find these bizarre. Okay, so this this poor woman was just killed. Where is she? Um, this woman. She is... She was a CEO. Uh, let me find her here. Um... Uh, hold on a second. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I wanted to do it. Is that it? Okay. Her name is, oh, let me, let me get this in a second here. Her name is Pava Lapera. She was a, she was in the, she was in Forbes, 30 under 30 techs. She was a CEO under 30 years old. Horrific story. Um, she uh, was found, um, hold on a second, um, she was found at her apartment building, where's, where's the original story, brutalized and on the roof somehow, um, let me, so, um, let's see where, okay, 26-year-old founder, Ecomaps Technology, Technologies, of uh, Technologies, who was named this year's Forbes 30 Under 30, was found that badly beaten and partially clothed on the rooftop of her upscale Baltimore apartment building. And you say, who could have done this to her? Well, they caught the guy. And interesting enough, they caught the guy like really near my house, <laughs> which is kind of really creepy. His name is Jason Billingsley. All right. 11, 10 PM. They caught him in Bowie. I live in Bowie. Yeah. That guy was out here. Mm, nice. We're armed. <laughs> We're armed. Anyway. Now, who is this guy? You say. All right. I'll tell you who this guy is. He is, let me find it here. Um, Billingsley is being eyed as the man who broke into the, no, he is where they got him. Um, he broke into a man and woman's house where he was handcuffed and where he handcuffed and duct taped them at 
gunpoint and then allegedly raped the woman before slashing her neck. He then allegedly doused them in liquid and set them on fire, nearly killing them. A five-year-old child was in the home, also suffered smoke inhalation. This is this is this guy. Now, Billingsley was released from prison. Get this one. Um, he was released from prison on mandatory supervision. Well, I guess they didn't supervise that guy too well. He was released from prison. He had like a 30-year term, and they put it down to 15 for, you know, good behavior. You know, because obviously he's not a psychopath, you know, just because he rapes and tortures people doesn't make him a psychopath. So here's a here's a guy who basically is a serial killer, uh, and they let him out of prison. That guy should have life without any parole. But no, he got out after 15 years. He So he went out from prison um, on mandatory supervision in October of 20, 2022 after serving. Oh, no, no. No, no, only nine years of a 14-year sentence. Oh, I forgot. It was a 30-year sentence. The judge knocked it down to 14, and then he got out early. So he only served nine years. Uh, credit for good behavior. Yes. He has pleaded guilty to first degree sexual assault in 2013 attack and was sentenced to 14 years behind bars and another 16 years as suspended sentence as part of a plea deal. The judge at the time said he didn't think the sentence was enough, but allowed it as the victim didn't want to testify at trial. Victims, I'm sorry, you got to do what you got to do. You let, if you didn't, were unwilling to testify, sorry, there's no, you let somebody else be killed. I'm sorry. I, I, I I'm so tired of people saying, well, you know, they're victims and they, they can't do it. I'm sorry. That, that, you have to do that. I know it. it's horrible. It's everything terrible. But if you don't, you're allowing the guy to walk. And so he did. Uh, so anyway, he got out. They weren't paying attention to where he was. And now he's ra raped and killed this woman. Just popped up. Uh, and so that's, that just blows me away. So let's look at a couple others before I look at your comments. And if anybody remembers her, uh, this is this is a beautiful young woman who was killed as a teenager. Uh, she was killed by mm -hmm, this woman and her buddies, Melinda Loveless. And I didn't, I, I didn't. This is actually four-year-old information, but I didn't. I just saw it today, and I thought it matched up with what I was talking about. That woman was connected to one of K Kentucky's most notorious murder cases. She's now out of prison. In 1992, Loveless and three others beat, tortured, and burned 12-year-old Shonda Scherer in the area of Madison, Indiana. Loveless organized the crime. She came to believe Scherer had stolen her girlfriend. So she got, let's see, what was her deal? Uh, she got, they took the death penalty off the table for Loveless and tack it as long as they pleaded guilty. They were both given the maximum sentence of 60 years, which under the Indiana statute can be cut in half for good behavior. Now, if they only had good behavior before the sentence, like good behavior, meaning not torturing and murdering people, maybe they shouldn't, wouldn't have gotten the sentence, but they get the sentence and then they're in custody. So they can't do the things that they did outside. And now they have good behavior. So they suspended and they got half the time. Loveless is one of the last of the four women to be released. Laura Tuck Tackett was out in 2018. The other ones were released in 2006, the other one in 2000. And now she's being supervised by Ken Kentucky probation and parole. I hope they're supervising her better than the guy that just Billingsley, who just killed the woman in Baltimore. I'm not so sure how good they supervise them. So, it's like, show up and let us know that you're still where you're supposed to be. Show up for your appointment. That's not supervision. That's nonsense. Sorry. If you, if you can't, you know, you can let a guy out who's, hmm, I don't know, maybe committed uh, some, some smaller crime and he's got to report in. I'm okay with that. You got a guy who is a rapist, a murderer, uh, any of those things. There's no such thing as unsupervised safety. Once they've done those things, they're unsafe forever. And the, the idea that they're just supposed to check in is absolutely ludicrous. So that's another one. I'm going to go to uh, the Jack in the Box shooting. This is insane. See this woman? 
So apparently she's shooting at the customer, at the jack in the box. And you, this is, this is, oops, sorry. Where's the other picture of my gun? Uh, I forgot to put the other picture. You can see her with the gun. She's shooting with the gun right there. Um, now, why is she shooting somebody at the jack in the box? You ask. All right. Do I have an answer for that? Okay, I do, but I'll have to find it. Hold on a second. There we go. This happened in Houston. This woman, there was a, there's a video of this, of her actually shooting the customer, <laughs> not, not, a, not a boyfriend, mind you. You know, she got in an argument, her boyfriend pulled up and she shot at him. We're not talking about a boyfriend. She was an employee who shot at a drive through customer over a argument over curly fries. So what happened was Ramos, a Florida resident, was in Houston for work after the February freeze. He picked up his pregnant wife and his, and his daughter, who was six years old at the time, from the airport, and he stopped at the drive-thru for food. 15 minutes later, they're speeding off in an attempt to avoid gunfire. Okay, so this woman is named Al Alonia Fantasia Ford, appears agitated with Ramos. He's in the driver's seat with his wife sitting in the front passenger seat and their daughter in the back seat, six-year-old. They paid $12.99 for a meal combo, but did not get the curly fries they ordered. Not even halfway into the dispute, the video shows Ford ready a gun. Minutes later, with another employee at the window, she throws ice and condiments at the car before she shoots twice at the vehicle. And we're not talking down. We're talking at the vehicle. Now, what happened? They're, they're suing Jack in the Box for hiring this woman, but that's, that's a whole other issue. Now, here's what I found amazing. Ford... This is the woman who shot at the vehicle with a child in it. Ford was initially charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. I would say attempted murder. I don't know, understand why it's not called attempted murder. When you shoot at somebody, it's attempted murder. I don't care if you're a lousy shot. Sometimes I think you should just be charged with murder. Just because you can't hit them doesn't make it any less of what you did. But she didn't even get attempted murder. She got aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, but pleaded guilty to a lesser charge because, you know, the video doesn't show what happened. She pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of deadly conduct. She got a sentence of one year deferred adjudication and completed it in June. All right. Now you're going to ask, first of all, why, why is a woman who just shot at a family getting a year in prison? Why isn't she a year? Why is she getting a year? Why isn't she getting 10 years, which is what she should get? Why is she just getting a year? But it's not even a year, folks. It's called deferred adjudication. And I had to look this crap up because I never heard of this deferred adjudication. Let me tell you what it is. All right. All right. Deferred adjudication is this. It's offered to first time offenders. Now, you know, deferred adjudication. OK, you want to say, oh, you're a first time offender. We're not going to put you in put you in jail because you shoplifted. All right. This is tempted murder. <laughs> it is typically a better deal than regular community supervision, because, of course, this woman just needs some supervision because she has a problem pulling out guns and shooting them at customers. Because if a person finishes the term successfully, the person does not have a conviction. Not only does she not go to prison or jail, she does. The, it can be erased from her record. A conviction is a loose legal term, meaning finding of guilt. So she's not even going to be guilty. A successfully completed deferred adjudication often can be sealed from public view and non-disclosure. So this woman will not be in the criminal records. So you want to hire her at your company? You want to hire her to watch your children, you look up the criminal record, it won't be there because she completed her, what, what, mm, her deferred adjudication. What the heck? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm going to look at your comments here. But that, that one, that one threw me over the edge. It really did. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, but you don't want to do it with a gun. She took a gun to work. She had a gun on her work. I'm really curious. Now, I know there's, I, uh, Texas is loose on, you know, that you can have right to carry and all that stuff. And I'm not objecting to that. Um, 
but you're not supposed to use it on the customers. You know, um, she didn't go to, she just didn't go to jail. As far as I can see, she never went to jail. She did this stupid, yeah, diversion crap. Unbelievable. Just absolutely. She should be in prison for 10 years, in my opinion. She almost killed a child. She almost killed a child. How is that okay? She gets to home at the end of the day. It makes zero sense. No. <laughs> she might be working at McDonald's now. You might have a point there. Because mm, they have terrible service these days. Only, only Chick-fil-A is the only one who has decent service. The rest of my, mm, it's pretty bad. Um, love those tacos. You know, I have a funny story about uh, Jack in the Box. So my sister just always loved Jack in the Box. And sis, if you're watching this sometime, my sister likes to, to listen to me late at night so I can put her to sleep. And um, so, but she loved Jack in the Box tacos. And, um, you know, they're, they were these, I'm, <laughs> they're not like Mexican tacos. They're like these really greasy things. You can see the grease on both sides of this like pale, <laughs> pale taco shell. And they were, they were like, they weren't Mexican, but at about one o'clock in the morning, those suckers, for some reason, were good. <laughs> one of those things that shouldn't be good. They're disgusting, but they're really good. So I always remember my sister did like the uh, the uh, Jack in the Box tacos. And I, I just have this weird vision one night of her coming back and bringing me those tacos when I was asleep. And yes, I woke up and ate them. But um, then we started not having Jack in the Boxes in the area. I was like, where did all the Jack in the Boxes go? Where's those tacos? But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm fat shaming. Uh, I just lost 20 pounds, by the way. Just want to let you know, I'm working hard at it. Two months now, working hard. I had a coffee in the morning, OMAD at night, one meal a day. I try, and I'm vegetarian, but I went almost keto just because I was trying to get the carbs really low because I knew I've been trying to lose the COVID weight for so long and I've had zero success. And I could just work so hard. And I'm like, seriously, it's been a month. I lost a pound. So I tried this OMAD thing, coffee in the morning, this one meal at night. And I get it all from Sunbasket. I love Sunbasket. They, you know, I, I pay for it to be sent to my house. I get my little thing. I cook my meal and it's usually five to 600 calories and it's so delicious. I'm, Sunbasket, I still want to represent you someday when you want to like give me free Sunbasket in return for doing this advertising. Um, fantastic. And so I look forward to this meal in the evening because it's so it's like a restaurant meal, but without all the grease. It's so damn good. I don't know who makes the recipes, but the flavor is ph phenomenal. So all you do is you open up, you go, I'll have this one, this one and this one. And that gives me six meals because you're supposed, you know, they're they're, the meals are set for two, but I don't have anybody living here. So I have to break the, I always cut them in half. I don't cook the whole thing and then put away leftovers. I just cut it, everything in half, cook the meal. So it's always fresh. And then I have these six meals for the week and I look forward to it. And it's that good that I, for some reason, I have not had cravings. I have not had sweets. I have not had bread. I have not had anything. I've lost 20 pounds in two months and I'm shocked. I just can't believe it's true. I mean, and I'm still enjoying it. So I like wake up to, I'm, Actually, I haven't eaten today. So I was supposed to eat before, but I got carried, carried off with other stuff. So when this finishes, I'm going to make a little, little light dinner tonight, and it'll be delicious. It's uh, I think it's, is it Ethiopian tonight? I'm not sure. All kinds of international foods. And I keep losing, and I am keep waiting for this to fall apart and not work, but it's worked for two months straight, and I've lost 20 pounds. So do I look thinner? <laughs> but I, I, I gained so much during COVID. I gained like like 50 pounds during COVID and I'm 20 pounds down. I still have 30 to go from the COVID weight and 10 to go from, I really need to be 140 and I'm not. So and now I've told you this. So now you can hound me every time we do a hangout. Did you lose the weight this week, Pat? <laughs> or did you gain it back? <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah. So I'm, I fat shame myself as well. I know when I look in the mirror, my eyes do not deceive me. It's like, it's like age. I'm, I get up in the morning. I look in the mirror and go, Ah, dang. <laughs> I'm a realist. I'm like, this is what it is. And if you can fix it, that's great. If you can't fix it. <laughs> Pat is so poor, she can't eat more than one meal. Shame on you, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, YouTube is starving me out here. <laughs> but but that one meal from Sun Basket is actually pretty expensive. It's about 15 bucks a meal. It's not a cheap thing. But it's so good, and it keeps me... I don't have to go shopping. 
I hate shopping. I hate picking out recipes. I hate going shopping for all these different recipes. And then I live alone. So I end up with all this extra crap because nobody's going to eat it with me. And then it all dies in the refrigerator. So I'm perfectly happy to pay the extra money. It comes to my house. I take it out. I make my dinner. I sit down. It's awesome. It's like, yeah, it's like making me super happy. So <laughs> I'll let you know how, if it keeps going, but yeah, <laughs> we'll find. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. 11 K. I don't know what it is. I think it's two. So you're doing great. Yeah. Oh, I'm glow. look good. I'm glowing. Oh, that, I never look any different than any other day. It's either the lighting or I put better makeup on. Who knows? I, I have no talent. So <laughs> Did you, oh, did you eliminate alcohol? Sure. There's no rum in there. <laughs> no, not exactly. Little, little cheaty time, you know, I cheat a I just don't like, I have not been hungry. It's weird. I haven't won sweets. I say bread, chips, anything. So it's been great. I can, I can eat tonight and I'll just get up tomorrow morning, have coffee and not eat till five o'clock in the evening. It's weird. It's like, this actually works. I mean, I'm shocked. I've, I've, I've been struggling for so long since COVID. And I'm like, yeah. So I made a deal. I was going to get down to the 140 pounds before I hit 70. And I gave myself two years. And so I'm ahead of schedule. So <laughs> I want my pretty clothes back. Uh, oh, hush. <laughs> Yeah, I don't drink a lot, but I do like a wee bit of tequila and a wee bit of rum, just here and there. Okay. All right. Let's get out of my personal life here. Why was I there? So I can have people say, Pat, we weren't here to hear about your personal life. <laughs> Tough crap. Um, anyway, all right. What else do I want to talk about? All right. A couple more things. Um, I want to talk uh, about, what is this? Oh, yeah. This is so sad. This, this is... This girl got murdered in Los Angeles. Her name is Nicole Coates. Beautiful girl. She was found dead inside her luxury apartment. And this girl was also found just, just a little while uh, earlier. Her name is Melissa Mooney. They said she's an aspiring model and real estate agent, 31 years old. They're both like 30. And then there's this other woman now who's freaked out because she lives in the same apartment as the first one who was murdered. And she's a uh, model, Brittany Mason. All these, just gorgeous. So she is pretty. And she is stunning. She pretty nice. But, but this, I think she's beautiful. I think she's beautiful. Anyway, so far, the two women have been murdered. They say they're not connected, even though they're very close, both murdered in their apartments. And the question is why? Who who got them? What they, and there's no information on this. I haven't heard anything about boyfriends. I haven't heard anything about lifestyle. And, and I'm, here I go again. So, here I say, if you're you're investigating, I have two things that come up in my head right away, and I'm these may be wrong because I'm not inside. I don't know what the fam what what's really happening here. But the first thing I noticed was was not her. Uh, okay, Th this is the first woman. She was in a luxury apartment. She's in a luxury apartment. They're both supposedly aspiring models. Now, mind you, I think she's gorgeous, but she's 32. And I cannot find anything online that tells me she's with a major agency. She's also an aspiring model. She's 31. I also find her name no, nowhere with aspire uh, with an agency. Now, generally speaking, if you're a, a successful model, first of all, 30s is not the time to become successful. It's 20s and below. So usually you, you hook up with an agency and then they promote you. So you're, you can go to, you can, you can put the person's name and you'll find them hooked up to an agency. And I find nothing with either one of these women. Although I'm not saying they're not beautiful, but they, and then they use the word aspiring. And I always get a little concerned about the aspiring. You're either a model or you're not. Um, what is an aspiring model? This person is not successful. <laughs> I went to LA. I mean, I was in Hollywood when I was 19 and I was an aspiring actress and an aspiring model. And I was nowhere successful at either one of those things. Otherwise, I would have been an actress and I would have been a model. You're 30 years old and you haven't actually reached the point where you're not called aspiring. I start questioning. You live in a luxury apartment by yourself. I looked at some of those prices. They were costly. It was 
those were nice those were nice places let me tell you when i got rid of my big old house and decided i was going to i was looking around and said where was i going to live one of the places i looked in the maryland area was was a place called silver spring and they had right downtown because the metro was there movie theater whole foods even if they did make me sick and i got my i sued them uh, anyway <laughs> um they had good restaurants in the area it's just it's a fun little area but the prices were astronomical for a studio, it's like $2,500 a month. And I'm like, I'm not paying $2,500 for a studio. And if I get a one-bedroom apartment, I was over $3,000. And then I have to get a roommate to afford to live there. These women are living in luxury apartments. I'm thinking, if you're aspiring, how much money could you be making? Because you don't make money. You make hardly anything unless you are a model with a decent agency. You don't get much money. And I'm just like, is this true? Or are we talking about women who will make money in other ways. I'm not saying this is true for these two women, but I find it very odd that there's not a mention of a modeling agency, that they're living in luxury apartments alone, and then they end up dead in those apartments alone. We'll have to wait and see. Did they involve themselves in some businesses that were dangerous? And we see a lot of women getting killed doing certain things that are indeed dangerous and uh i don't know i don't know because they're not saying anything at this point but is it a serial killer uh who is trolling certain websites is it bo bad boyfriends is it a serial killer like the guy who got the woman in uh, baltimore she wasn't doing any of this stuff he was i say i think he started got a, like a job in the building and just slithered into an apartment and killed her um they weren't dating. She she wasn't on any websites. She was a CEO. And that was clearly a serial killer. And his history proves that. But we haven't gotten any of this information. It's like going a couple of weeks now. It's like, what's going on? What happened to these women? Now, the problem is, again, if you don't, if you're unwilling to find, the, to, the police have to focus on the truth. Were they involved in totally credible businesses and did not involve themselves in anything that brought them into contact with strange men. If that's true, then we have, might have a serial killer running around, unless these two girls both have bad boyfriends. If they were involved in other ways of making money, then we have to look that direction because that's how they're being targeted. So, you know, when, when, when a police officer starts questioning the family, they ask questions and the family sometimes gets very upset, friends get very upset. And sometimes they try to keep these things out of the media. So, but when I see aspiring model, it always sends up a red flag. Not saying they couldn't be, but at 31, you should have made it by now. But they're so, they're very pretty. I mean, I mean, I think they're gorgeous. No, they were gorgeous. Now they're dead. But I mean, personally, I think they should be great. I mean, especially her. I mean, I am, I think she's just stunning. I would, I would hire, I, I'd hire her as a model in a heartbeat. She's pretty. I mean, I think she would just be the best model. And there's a lot of other pictures of her just, you know, associated with the sad, her sad death. She's gorgeous. But I can't find her with, uh, if you are, if you find her with a modeling agency, send that over to me. I'd be curious. And I'll do that in the next uh, hangout and say, yeah, I didn't find her. Um, and this woman is terrified. She wants to get out of the building uh, that, that the other woman got killed in. Uh, and she's very attractive too. And she looks very modely there. Um, and again, she's 26. She's a little younger. She looks, I don't know. I haven't looked up her name yet. She looks like a model, um, but they all look like models, but the, you know, there's modeling is a difficult industry, even when you're gorgeous to get into. And people don't realize that, Oh, she's got, she, she clearly should be successful. I think so. But I thought I looked good at 19 too. And I wasn't a success. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Um, uh, well, this is the question. I don't know if this is all behind the scenes or not yet at the moment. I don't know. Um, uh, Lala says, we hire models, Pat, for this. Sounds like other work to me for many reasons. There's no aspiring models. That's what I think. Did you see? And I modeled, I modeled your PJs. <laughs> By the way, if you if you saw my last year profiler, Pat, Lila sent me those lovely PJs and they're so comfy and the fall is coming. So I'm snuggling around in them so. <laughs> uh, and they fit perfectly. Lila, Lila looked at me and she's like, 
I know what size she is. <laughs> and she was accurate. <laughs> so she's really good. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, let me see what else I, have, I want to talk about. Uh, I just, I, I, you know, when I see these women, they're just, they're just uh, so sad. It's just really super sad. Um, this is, oh, oh, no, I want to talk about this. Now we're talking about cr cr criminals not getting proper sentences. Now check this out. Just, just, this blows me away. So this is, and I'll, maybe there's something more to this story that we haven't heard. This is a DoorDash driver. Okay. Now, apparently this is what happened. The DoorDash driver was trying to deliver. Let's see what they're trying to deliver. They followed the GPS. And this is another sad story where a guy followed the GPS, took him onto a bridge that didn't have any blockade at night in a rainstorm. And he went off the bridge because it was not a real bridge and died. And it was real sad. So this is a DoorDash driver. So this DoorDash driver following GPS, supposedly was trying to deliver a Dunkin' Donuts order. And, you know, it's so funny because you they, literally today you, you can order like 7-Eleven and get it delivered. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, they followed the uh, the dunk the GPS and then wound up in the woods and then in the water in Middleton trying to deliver an order. The mishap occurred on Friday around 11:40 a.m. a.m. Looks very dark. 11:40. I thought it was at night. It's during the day. Okay, maybe that that shifts things. Police said when the driver called out and reported the car was disabled in water, the driver had managed to get out of the car. Uh, and walked to a home on Kenny Road where the officers found the person panicked that their water was their their vehicle was underwater. The op operator stated they were following the GPS to an address in Middleton while trying to deliver Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, okay, it's Donuts. Maybe they did. Maybe it was a morning order. <laughs> you know, you can have them at night too. But yeah, I get it. You want you want your donuts before you have your co coffee and donuts, and you just get up at ten o'clock, eleven o'clock from that night before. You want your donuts. You don't want to drive there. All right. Uh, the operator of delivery in hand. The operator stated that while trying to make the delivery to an address in Mill Street, the same began driving down a dirt road and then somehow ended up driving into a body of water. All right. They found the car partially submerged but still running down a dirt path. The car was towed away without any apparent fuel leakage into the water. The driver was taken to Beverly Hospital after requesting a medical transport and now faces charges of negligent operation of a motor vehicle. And also, the, the police asked the RMV to dis suspend her license at, as an immediate threat. So, so we get killers who are let out of prison because just well because they have good behavior. This person, and I say there might be more to the story. Like the person, they didn't say the person was uh, inebriated. Uh, you know that they were they, they were on drugs. They didn't say that. And I want to know, did they follow the GPS? And admittedly, you know, you go down a dirt road and you think, come on now. And then all of a sudden, you're, you know, you're, you run into water and you're screwed. Um, I don't know why. What's the, what's the, what they say it was negligent operation of a motor vehicle. She should have, was it she? Her, yeah. She should have noted ahead of her that there was water in the road that she was getting into and should not have submerged her vehicle. Are you saying that there aren't people who have accidentally driven off a road into a ditch that for whatever reasons, um, who haven't decided to, you know, when it's raining to cr continue across a road that they shouldn't have and they get swept away. Is that, you know, she wasn't harming anybody. She wasn't on a major road. She wasn't hurting anyone. She just basically submerged her cars in some water and like, ah, crap. You know, I don't know that it's stupid maybe, but I don't know that it's, I'm like, she got negligent driving. So I have, to, is there something more? Then she got her license suspended. Now this is, she delivers for DoorDash. That's how she makes her money. So now she can't work. So why is her license suspended? They don't say she's suspended because, I don't know, did she have 12 other, you know, um, things on her record? Uh, did she have bizarre behavior? So as they'd say, my God, the woman's crazy. I mean, What's the issue? And it's funny. It just, you know, after you read all these killers walking free, and then you got, you got a woman who shoots a family at a jack in the box. And she's, she's free the next day. I'm sure she's driving her car around, <laughs> but here's a woman who on an off road drives into some water and she's getting given negligent driving having her, her license. Pulled. It just seems to me like, you know, really? It's just, 
it's just odd. And I'm, I'm curious, well, again, we're going to see what happens. I don't know if we're getting the full story, but, but it just seemed kind of funny when you talk about a woman who doesn't even get jail time for shooting at people. And this woman makes an error because she follows GPS, even if she's crazy, and they're going to take away her license so she can't work. Like, ah, that's just crazy. Um, <laughs> Um, I I appreciate this, Aunt Danny. DoorDash is dangerous enough. Now they have to worry about criminal charges for getting lost. Um, And my son works for DoorDash, by the way. He um, he lost his job in in, in COVID. He has a back injury. He just had surgery. He can't work in the field he worked in. So at least he's trying to pay his bills while he is is applying for jobs that don't require physical labor anymore because he worked in roofing. He works his butt off doing DoorDash to earn enough money to pay his bills so he's not on the dole, so he's not a welfare recipient, so he's not homeless and begging. He's doing what he needs to do, which I think I think is admirable. Um, and he deserves a way better. He's a real smart guy. Um, but, you know, he had some fortunate luck with the, with the back injury. And um, so he's he does it. But, boy, he says, yep, not going there. <laughs> Be Why? Because if he goes there, he can get killed. It is dangerous out there, especially in the Mar- we live in Prince George's County, Maryland, where apparently we have a lot of crime now. So if he get he's sent places, he's like, I'm not going. Uh, there's no way I'm I'm not going there, even though they're not carrying cash, even though they're not doing that. Um, they still can get carjacked. Uh, they still can get to for whatever reason. So and he's a big dude, so at least he's got that going for him. But he, he says there's places he will not take the chance on. Absolutely not. Um, and so it's a risky business now. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, here you are trying to survive because the economy is dreadful and, and, and there's a lot less jobs than people claim there are because there's a lot of fake job offerings where you go and you interview and there's not really a job available. They just do that to make the company look good. That's unbelievable. So that's a whole nother issue, but people are working hard and trying to survive. Did this woman deserve her license to be taken away and charges when she didn't hurt anybody. Now I'm not saying maybe they know, maybe there's something more to this. Maybe they realize she shouldn't be on the road period for whatever reasons. And I don't know. I, I don't know the rest of the story, but just after I saw the Jack in the box thing, I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> it's like, now you, you're going to penalize this woman, but you're not going to penalize a woman who shoots at a family and a Jack in the box. Talk about unequal justice. This is insane. It's just insane. Oh my God. Just, um. okay. I have just one more thing I'm going to talk about. Hmm, what was it? Um, two more things. Okay. I just want to talk about, this is just for fun. Um, that's not funny for the person who had it happen to her. But um, this is an alligator. And I felt sorry for the alligator because there's this huge alligator. And apparently somebody saw it wandering around with a woman in his mouth. Um, so they called the you know the police and everybody to come out and take care of these, uh, this, this alligator that was wandering around with a with a, with a woman in its mouth. Now, one of the interesting questions about this case was, how did the woman get in the mouth of the alligator? They shot the alligator immediately. And I kind of felt bad for the alligator because they didn't find, it was like, um, was it, did the alligator kill the woman? Because at that point they didn't know, she was clearly dead. It wasn't any question of like, you know, you had to shoot the alligator because it was chomping on a live woman. It was going like this. She was clearly dead. So why did they shoot the alligator before finding out whether the alligator even killed the woman? So the question was, was there a woman who was like taking a nice walk and the alligator, you know, and killed a human. And then, you know, people get worried about that and kill and, and kill them. But I'm like, was the woman already dead? And he found, he found a body. He found a corpse and an alligator. He just picked it up. Well, this is what it turned out to be. So that alligator, um, what happened was, uh, so this was a 13 foot alligator carrying a body, a female body. And he alerted the, the fire department. The authorities humanely killed it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And the responders yanked it from the water and shot it several times. Uh, the, the gators, um, which is a problem. There's a lake there. All right. Known to house alligators. Now here's the first clue. It's a lake with alligators. What don't you do when there's a lake with alligators? The gators wa- routinely wander the neighborhood. Huh. Huh. You know, sometimes they do come up to your door. <laughs> you're, you're knocking on the, who is it? 
<laughs> yeah, uh, the gators routinely wander the neighborhood, but the one killed Friday was one of the biggest they'd ever seen. All right. Um, where the heck is the rest of it? Come on. Where's the rest of the article? Uh, okay, here we go. So I'm going to write these articles backwards. So anyway, the woman whose lifeless body was found in, clenched in the alligator mouth was arrested just two months ago for trespassing on county wetland properly property. So she was trespassing on the property that you're not allowed to walk on because the alligators are there. Sabrina Peckham, 41, was identified by police as the victim being dragged by the beast in a canal along a residential street in Largo, a small community four miles from south of Clearwater, Florida. The homeless woman. Now, here we have the second problem. OK, so she's homeless and she's trespassing. She's not in a shelter and probably, and, uh, and whenever I say this, I usually believe that there are drugs involved. That's, that's the most reason why people won't go in a shelter. There are a few people who just don't want to be housed. They like the freedom, but a good portion of time, it's because they're doing drugs and they can't, you know, the shelters prevent some of that from happening. Uh, the homeless woman was caught for trespassing on County Wetland, just half a mile from where she was found dead. She ignored posted signage warning against unlawful entry. After pleading no contest to the misdemeanor, she was released by the county and was fined $500, which I'm pretty sure she did not pay. Uh, it is not clear whether the trans, trans, transient woman went in two weeks before she was discovered dead in the airway. Oh, where she where she went? Okay. They don't know where she was. Uh, she had a history of run-ins with the police dating back to 2014, including multiple charges for trespassing. Peckham also had multiple drug and theft convictions lodged against her. Investigators are still trying to determine whether Peckham was killed by the gator. Poor gator. That's all I can say. <laughs> Poor gator. Uh, you know, this woman uh, was uh, sad that she ended up where she was, but clearly that's a drugs. I hate drugs and I'm tired of people doing drugs and I'm, I, I'm losing all sympathy because drugs are destroying our nation. Drugs are destroying people and People who take drugs support the cartels and they support more people getting drugs. So I'm kind of done with being real sympathetic. And she caught, she was drug using. She was, she was uh, trespassing. She was stealing. So, you know, this, this sets you in a horrible, horrible tra trajectory downhill. Um, and I think we need to stop the drugs, but I guess the alligator stopped the drugs. So we shouldn't have to wait for the alligator to kill people. We should, there should be some way to stop the drugs and people from using them. We just might have to be a little tougher than we are today. So, um, yeah, Su suicide by alligator. No, I'm pretty sure she just wasn't paying attention. And she, I don't know why she was trespassing on the land there. Uh, maybe she was trying to find a place to stay. I don't know. Okay, I have one last thing I want to talk about as I go away, because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna continue the conversation, but since, because this is, this is such a, uh, tough one uh because we're talking the 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 the, the trial for Amaya uh um what's her name Kowal oh, I forgot her name now Kowal <laughs> Kowalski Kowalski Maya Kowalski is going on and take care of Maya was the Netflix film uh I have we've already done I've already done the show on that uh very contentious in a way because you know it's one of these things where who's the bad guy um in this whole thing and and um, I, the show has been done. It'll be it'll be go public this weekend. Um, but I wanted to mention Munchausen Center by proxy. I just want to clear up what that is, and then I'm going to end the show because I don't want a huge huge discussion over this. But I want to point this one thing out, which I thought was really important. When oftentimes we talk about Munchausen Center by proxy, which is when a person harms them. Uh, Munchausen syndrome was a person harms themselves for attention. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is when they harm a child for attention. That's, that's what it basically is. It's it, a lot of people think it's a disease or a, it's a way of, it's, it's, a, it's a mental disorder. It's not, it is Munchausen syndrome. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is a behavior. And usually I say behavior of psychopaths because oftentimes we're talking about people, kids, kids who are murdered. You know what I mean? There are uh, women who murder one child after the other or Lucy Letby, who's killing all the babies in the nursery. That's Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And you have to be psychopath to kill, 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 kill. Um, and then there are 
but a Munchausen syndrome, you're not necessarily killing yourself, but you're claiming you've been raped. You're claiming you, you got kidnapped like Sherry Papini. And a good portion are what I would call psychopathic. But I just want to explain one thing. There is a continuum. Here we are as healthy people. You get up to this side, then you get very psychopathic. In between is levels of narcissism and stuff like that. Do I believe a person who is Munchausen syndrome by proxy or Munchausen syndrome has to be full-blown psychopath? Not necessarily. They can be very highly narcissistic so that they, they, they do more than is they need to do to get attention. They aren't quite to the level of homicide, but they do way more than they need to do uh, because it's just whatever is happening is just not enough. It's just not enough. And, and it doesn't fulfill them to make them feel like they are who they are and have power, control, and, and are, are maybe even complimented for the hard work they're doing, taking care of their child or whatever it might be. So in the, in the case of uh, uh, Maya Kowalski, um, you have a girl who was nine years old when she went to the hospital. The hospital staff flagged her mother, Beata, as being Munchausen in my proxy. And I'd already did this whole thing. So I don't want to discuss. I do not want a discussion here, Sarah. <laughs> I know you have really strong feelings of that. Um, and I don't want to go there. And I don't care if they cleared her. That, that has nothing to do with anything. I, as a profiler, were lo was looking at the behaviors. I find Beata having behaviors of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. That doesn't mean she's a 100% psychopath. She could be highly narcissistic. Doesn't mean that her daughter did not have the condition that her daughter had. But it also can mean that the mother makes choices that are unsafe for her child, maybe excessive, because that's how she gets attention. So sometimes they can actually have the issue, but it's exaggerated because it's just not enough for the person. So they go down riskier routes. They will not cooperate. They have to have all the attention. I have to be the one that makes the decision. You, you have to follow me. That's signs of, those are concerning signs. So I just want to point out, because I'm not going to go on this whole discussion again, um, because I know it's very, very, polarizing in a sense, but I do believe that Beata had that, the, the, the behaviors of much as a sin by proxy doesn't mean her daughter did not have the condition. It doesn't mean that she didn't want, especially in the beginning to help her daughter, but she went egregiously too far. And all her behaviors at the hospital were what flagged them out. Being a nurse that knows how hospitals run, being a nurse who could have agreed to certain other procedures in order to get her daughter out of the hospital, she would not cooperate. She went immediately to what she thought she had to have, what she believed. And this is a sign of narcissism where you cannot cooperate at all. And you know, I don't have a love for hospitals or, the, or medical <laughs> situations, but I'm not going to get into all that. That's in the, the, uh, that's in the video. So you can go look at it. But I just wanted to say, which has incentive by proxy and which has incentive don't necessarily mean you're totally at the end of psychopathy. But you're definitely in the narcissism category where you start having difficulty evaluating what is healthy. Your, the health of your child gets overtaken by your need for attention so that you it becomes unbalanced. You do things that are far, far more than is necessary to, quote, protect your child or get her, get her help or whatever. And going from doctor to doctor to doctor is often that you're seeking somebody who will do your will and you'll eventually find somebody and they do what you want. And that gives you the power and control. There's a lot of issues there. I don't, I don't know if we're, what we're going to see in the trial, but I'm going to stand by that. But I just want to explain Munchausen syndrome by proxy and say that you can, a child can still have the disease that doesn't eliminate the mother having Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And it doesn't mean that at some point the mother wasn't trying to help the child, but just that it got out of control for her because her needs overwhelmed the needs of the child. And that's narcissism. And that happens all the time. I mean, it's not an unusual thing that a person, a parent may not be able to, they'll, um, I don't want to get political. We're going to say this at the end here, just because it is becoming a real concern. So we have a lot of um, parents who, are pushing transgenderism for children who are two and three years old. As if a two or three year old knows what the hell they want. Uh, that 
you know, we have kids, we, we don't allow them to make other choices in life, but somehow we allow them to make a choice of not being the sex they're born in and, be, and wanting to be the other sex. And we start dressing them in other clothing to represent the other sex and calling them a girl when they're a boy or a boy when they're a girl. Now, I don't want to get in the political discussion whether transgenderism is, is whatever, but there are some parents there who are Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And what they're doing is they see they're using their children to gain that attention. Now, may that child have a confusion? May that child have some propensity for a certain direction of their behaviors? They may. I'm not even going to say whether it's right or wrong. But what I see is that there are some parents who will jump on this because having a normal kid, normal, does not get them the attention of having a child you can say is trans. And then you can run around in a community talking about how your child is trans at three years old and push this and get a massive amount of attention. That's Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Whether that child truly feels that way or whether the parent's pushing them to feel that way, it all gets into a very gray area. So, but I want to say, Munchausen syndrome by proxy can mean that the child does not have the, d the disease or an inclination or anything, but the parent then forces it onto them. They either poison them or they go to the doctor claiming the child has conditions they don't have, or they claim the child is saying this, what the child never said. That's 100% psychopathy. When they're imposing a disease or, or a mental uh, condition onto their child. Then we have those that the child actually has the disease or the propensity for something. And the parent over here then takes that and runs with it to the point where it, the parent is all about getting the attention and not so much the health of the child. That's Munchausen syndrome by proxy as well. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there so we don't have a really, really crazy discussion on it. But anyway, Sarah, stop. <laughs> yeah, I know you're going to. You're going to have to go on another channel for that because there's there's a, that you're getting into the you're getting into an argument for for the uh, for the defense. Uh, I mean, for the in this case, for the for the family against the hospital, a big argument that the hospital did all these bad things. And I don't want that argument here just because I, I'm going to say, go watch, go watch the go watch the trial, see what it comes. I think you may end up still, you know, no matter what, end up on the family believing that the mother was just a good hearted mother and she killed herself because she couldn't take it. And I don't believe that's true. Ah, so we'll have to agree to disagree because <laughs> we agree on other things, just maybe not this. And that's why I put it at the end of the show because I don't want a big argument over it. All right. So anyway, that is the show for tonight. Thank you for being here, everybody. I'm going to go make my, oh man, my one meal a day. So I, cause I'm really actually feeling a little hungry now. <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank you for being here. <laughs> Yay. That's what I like. That's the attitude I like. We don't always agree. We can't always agree. And we don't, I don't, you know, I don't like to cancel people because I don't, you know, they don't agree with me and I, I don't agree with them on certain issues because we might agree on everything else, but just not that. And, you know, people have their experiences and I bring that to play. Um, and that's okay. That's okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, and so I hope we we'll stay friends. So, <laughs> so <laughs> there we go. It's not personal. I'm glad it's not personal this way. See? Uh, see, see, the, it's funny because people sometimes say, I see you block people all the time on YouTube. Yes, because they're nasty. <laughs> Don't come in and be nasty to her, man. Call me an idiot and a fool and a fraud. Yeah, I'm going to block you just like that. <laughs> but if you're friendly, that doesn't happen because, you know, I, I'm not always right, even if I think I am. No, <laughs> I'm not always right. Nobody is always right. And we, there are just some areas where that gray area or the difference to seeing it different ways, or it, it, it's going to be there. That's why we have trials essentially. That's why we have civil and, and, and criminal trials because they're obviously two different sides. So, you know, it's, and then we, we struggle through life all, all the time dealing with this kind of thing. So yeah, that's the way it is. So, oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, Oh, <laughs> you asked this. Okay. Let me, I, I, I have to tell you this. Uh, always send me an email. Um, always send me an email. Uh, actually, on my website, there is an address. It is to a UPS box because for years I've had a UPS box for safety reasons. Um, uh, because, you know, the last thing I want is majority of people to know where I live. 
and then we have to shoot them when they come up here. But um, <laughs> uh, so we were kind of a, you know, we, my daughter's a, uh, you know, police and I'm a profiler. So we, you know, we just want to be a little cautious, but I did have a UPS box, but nobody, <laughs> this is the thing, almost nobody uses the mail anymore. So I'm freaking like paying this extraordinary amount per year to have a box. It's always empty because everybody does everything by email. Uh, they, you know, everything, they, almost everything is done that way. And on rare occasions, I'd like a police, somebody would say, hey, Pat, I need to send you something. Then what I do is I can tell them to send it to my house because they're, they're law enforcement. But the question is, what happens when other people would like to send me something? Uh, most most time it's rare. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be, so don't go to the website and use that address because I'm, I, it's taken me, I have been searching for a website person for like the last month or two. I can't find anybody who does the old HTML sites, which is what mine is. It's not WordPress and they just don't know anything anymore. I was like, Frank, I got to, this is my week's work next week. So I can eliminate that. And essentially people send me an email and if, and if it's, uh, they're going to send me something, also travel. So what I do is I try to send it general mail. So you send it general mail and I can pick it up from the post office. That's my methodology on that now because I don't really want to spend six, $700 a year on a box that's <laughs> empty all the time. <laughs> and sometimes I'm not even there. If I'm in India for a month or I'm in Florida for a month or I'm in Hawaii for a month, I can't even pick up the stuff, you know? So it's better that I use a general uh, address, which people do with RVs when they RV around the country. They'll say, I'm going to be in, let's say, uh, Spokane, Washington next week. And they tell somebody to send something general mail and they can pick it right up at the, at the uh, post office. Pretty cool. I didn't even know that it existed. So <laughs> yeah, I want to be in Hawaii. So that is where I wish I was. And maybe I will be in January. So anyway, there you go. Um, yes, I, I've been. I, oh, yes. Um, I did check that out. I didn't even know it existed anymore. So I did go to the post office and actually ask about that. So I figure if I'm going to get like four deliveries a year, I'm just going to go with that because I can't, I don't, you know. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? I didn't know that either. Yeah. So it exists. I thought it was like something from like 1800s. <laughs> hey, I, Lex, I want to come to Hawaii. Well, where's your thing? I want to come. I'm sorry. I want to come to Australia very much. But it, I, the problem I'm having is not being in Australia. I would step, have no problem being in Australia for a month because um, I really want to come. Uh, I'm having trouble figuring out how I'm going to get there and not have to suffer sitting up in a seat and coach for God knows how many hours. I can't afford first class. And I can't, I want to lie down. And that's, if I can't lie down, I'm just tortured and nothing works. I've tried, I've tried medication. I tried alcohol. I tried being tired for days on end before I get on the plane. Nothing works. It's just torture. So if I can find a way to lay down, I'm on my way. <laughs> but the, the, so far the flights to Australia, whoo, the lay down price is like $10,000 or something outrageous. So, yeah. So, but <laughs> that is true. This is exactly why I can, the, the thing about YouTube is really great. Cause I did, I did YouTube out of Puerto Rico. Um, I want to be able to go someplace. If I want to stay someplace warm in the winter for three months in Mexico, Hawaii, Australia, wherever the heck it is. And I'll, I can still continue my uh, YouTube channel and I don't you know. So that's pretty cool. So yeah, that is one thing that's really awesome about um, YouTube that I can take it with me. I have to have good, I have to have good internet though. If I can't get good internet, then I'm screwed. So I have to make sure wherever I'm at is not like fluctuating so that I can't do a show properly. So that is an issue, but I'm working at it. Anyway, thank you guys for being here. You're wonderful as usual. I'm going to go eat because I really want to eat. And if you're new to the channel and you're still here, subscribe, subscribe, join Patreon below. Still an educational channel. You need the help. <laughs> anyway, see you guys. Oh, Mm. Okay, so I haven't made my decision on the, the case this weekend. So if you have something you, you know you've told me you wanted me to, to do before and I've ignored you, mostly because I get a lot of requests in on it and I try to put them in piles and try to eventually get to them if I think it's a good case. Well, I haven't made my decision yet, so you have a chance. You know, message me and tell me, hey, I asked you about this before. Could you do it? And maybe I will. You know, somebody's going to – I'm going to do one case, so I don't know which one, but – I'm still thinking about it. I think I have one idea. So I may, I may do, oh, I may do that one. But you can always send other ideas. Anyway, see you, see you later. Bye.